Look at this little guy. Oh my goodness. Great job. Look at that little boy. Wow. And I have to say, the hardest thing God asks us to do, other than love someone all your life, is to raise a godly kid. God gives us the formula in Deuteronomy 6, and that is to talk to your children about God when they're getting up, when they're sitting down to eat, when you're walking along the road, and when you're putting them in the bed. That means God wants us to super saturate them with God and his word and and. Uh, uh, you're going to love this boy because I know he loves mom right now, but after five, he's going to be daddy's boy. Am I right? Isn't that how that works? Yeah. And so we're going to lay hands. Would you stretch your hands forward? We're going to ask God to bless this little boy. Father, we lift up Luke Emilio right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I, I pray, Father, for the father and I pray for the mother, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, love, kindness, Lord, that they would, and patience, Lord God, as they raise this little boy in the fear of the Lord. Lord, your word says that your angels are always before your face, that the, the angels are the children, Lord God. So I know he already has an angel, that the, he already has an assignment in life. Lord, I ask that you give him a heart sensitive to you, that at an early age his heart would turn towards you, Lord God, and that he would reflect you in his life. Lord, give him a long life. Let it be prosperous, Lord. Let him be successful, Lord. Prepare a godly woman for him, Lord God. Bless his life, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look at that beautiful boy. Congratulations. Great job. Great job. God bless you. Amen. Look at that baby. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. We love babies and we love kids. Amen. Hey, uh, I just wanted to give you an update. Um, I want to read a scripture because it's about our giving because when we give to God's kingdom, it goes all around the world. And uh, this is what God does with our money. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 to 12. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. All right. Where are our slides? Our slide people. Anthony, wake up. Okay, as it is written, we, we normally have slides, by the way. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, bread to the uh, bread and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Yeah, so um, I don't know if we've got them, but so... Of a few months ago, well, actually about last month, uh, I heard that, you know, we've planted seven churches in Africa, and I heard that they closed East Africa because of the third wave of COVID running through. And in those areas where you have a, a, a different economy than we have, they don't have a large federal government. Everyone uh, usually grows their own food. And when they close the doors of the church, that means the pastors usually starve. And so when they would close Uganda and Eastern Africa for 45 days, God put it in my heart to, and I, and I shared it with you, hey, let's send some money. So we sent $3,000, but you guys did better. You kept giving money. We sent extra money, and uh, they sent us a list of 31 pastors. Other than the seven that we've started, they helped we, our money went and helped sustain 31 different pastors. And I have a list. I have three different lists, and I'm going to guess uh, we might not be able to see that today, but um, it, it, we got them there. Okay, we're getting close to it, but the names and the cities where they live and where they pastor. You know, uh, when you pastor a church, yeah, there, there they go. Here we go. And, and here we have different names. The, the name of the church, uh, the Pastor Titus Kasongo Worship Center, Kabale Worship Center, Buganga Worship Center, Kitikio. And there's three different ones. There's the first, that's the second page uh, of, uh, it's from 11 to 20. And uh, go to that third page. There we go. And, uh, and you can see every name, every city. They're, they're probably many times in those African communities, they're the only church, living church in that city. We helped sustain 31 pastors and their families. Great job, church. We love you guys. Amen. Hey, so we want to we thank you for the great job you've done. Your tithe goes all over the world. We planted, uh, in this place, we planted at least 16 churches and uh, because we love to do that. Um, we're going to Africa next year because we love giving, we love planting churches, and we love we love the we love the world. You know, my goal is before I die to plant a church in every 
every nation of this earth. And I'm a little behind. I just want you to know. So I figure I'm going to live at this rate about to 160 years old. So uh, either I have to get together, work more, or I'm going to have to give that, pass it off to my, my sons and daughters to finish that work for me. But anyway, great job, church. We love you guys. Amen. I want to thank those that are watching online. Uh, we have people that watch online, especially, you know, how, how, how things go today. But today we're starting a new series, Spiritual DNA. Thank you, Isabella. If you don't know, this is my daughter, Isabella. And um, she always plays just one minute more than I want her to. No. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. I love her. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with family, uh, you're, you can almost say anything and they won't leave you, right? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, hey, I want to talk about spiritual DNA because this is a this is a, an, an important thing. But I'm going to ask God to open our hearts and open our minds that His Word would change our hearts. Father, Your Word today is so special. Open our hearts, Spirit of God, show us truth, Lord, that would change our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture for the whole series is First John three nine. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed, that means God's seed, God's divine sperm, his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Now, I like the, I like the common English Bible. A lot of translations translate a little differently. Whoever has been born of God does not, no, the next one, go to that next one. There we go. Those born from God don't practice sin because God's DNA remains in them. They can't sin because they're born from God. And the, the, the thing you need to know today is that when you receive Christ, we sense the difference inside because God put his spirit in us. Our spirit became one with his spirit. That's what the Bible says. He that is joined to the Lord has become one spirit. God's spirit is in you. And guess what? He inserted his DNA, his spiritual DNA inside you. In fact, if you look at the bullets, and I think on the back, there are fill in the blanks. The answer to number one is you have God's DNA inside you, okay? Do you know why this is so important to understand? I want to tell you why. Because much of our spiritual DNA has to be explained for it to manifest in our life. So you've got these ideas, you've got these thoughts, you've got these feelings, you've got this a passion, and you don't know why you have it. It is because God has put his DNA in you, and it has to be explained for you to realize it. To help illustrate that, I want to tell you the story of the chicken, the chickens and the eagle. And now if you've heard the story, go to that first picture. Let me share the story. It happens that there was an eagle on a mountainside, and in his nest, he had four little eggs. We're not going to get that picture, I guess. Anyway, so he had four little eagle eggs in his nest, and an earthquake rocked the mountain. One of the eggs fell out, rolled all the way down to the bottom of the hill where there was a chicken farm. When the chickens saw the, the egg, they picked it up. They, they nudged it into their little chicken coop, and one mother hen, she just sat on that egg until it, it, until it hatched. And I want you to know that that, that eagle grew up with the chickens and he began to act like a chicken. That's right. He was eating worms. He was eating dirt. Have you ever seen chickens? They are stupid. They eat anything. I'll never forget one time uh, we were at a place. We were in the middle of the jungle at this city, my wife and I. And the pastor had killed his only chicken to give us a meal. It was so humbling. And uh, so we're, we're trying to, eat, uh, we're trying, well, he, he had more than one chicken, but the, the, this was the, the one that, you know, the, the younger ones are a little more tender. So that was, there was still an old rooster out there. And so we're eating. And of course you're eating in the jungle. There are bugs everywhere. And there's, there we go. There's our, there's our little eaglet with the, thank you for three minutes later. Keep it on there. We're good. But, it, but I want you to catch something here. So there we are. We're eating this chicken, feeling bad about eating it. And there is this colossal life and death struggle. There is some sort of caterpillar, and these nasty ants are trying to kill it, and they have swarmed the thing. It's trying to move. It's trying to live. And, and I can't even listen to the pastor because I'm watching the caterpillar and the ants. Who is going to win this titanic struggle? And then the rooster comes by and eats them all up. And that's how that was one went. But anyway, moving on to chickens, eagles. Well, so now I want you to catch this. Now this... How many of you know the eaglet, after a while, felt he was just a little different than the other ones? He was a lot bigger. Uh, but they treated the little eagle like a chicken. Since they didn't know anything about eagles, one day the little eagle looked up. At that, that's that next picture, Anthony. And, uh, in, and they saw this eagle soaring in the sky, okay? And he told all his other chicken friends, 
I want to fly like those birds up there. And they said, what? You're not an eagle. You're a chicken like us. And the baby eagle, he was happy with his chicken family. But he seemed to be missing something, okay? Follow me. Every day he'd look at the sky. He'd long to fly. And every time he'd tell his fellow chickens of his dreams of flying, and you know what they would say? You can't fly because you're a chicken and that's all you'll ever be. Now, if you've ever seen this story online, there's two different endings, okay, depending on which one you read. The first ending is he imitated the chickens around him and he died a chicken. The other, story, the other ending is that one day he decided to try it out and actually flap his wings and fly and he became an eagle and that's how he lived his life out. Here's the issue. The jury is out concerning you. When you receive Christ, God put his spiritual DNA inside you, but sad to say most of us Christians live like the chickens around us. We never become what God made us to be. See, my goal for you, better said, God's goal for you, and this is the answer to number two, is that you become everything God made you to be, is to become everything God made you to be. God placed his spirit, his spiritual DNA inside you. You can actually do more and be more than the chickens around you. Can you say amen? That's right. And I want you to know we have a goal. Ephesians 4.15 says this that we are to grow up into him in all aspects into him who is the head, that is the Christ. Christ is our example. We are to look like him. We're to talk like him. We're to act like him. Every situation in life, we have to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Am I right? He is our example. So for the next month, we're going to be talking about who you now are that you are in Christ. You realize the whole New Testament was written because you don't know who you are. You think you're a chicken, but you're actually an eagle. And God is trying to tell you who you are. So I want to tackle a couple of things about DNA that's super important. Today, I want to ask, answer the first question, why church? Why go to church, okay? Now, you know, this should have been an easy assignment for me because, you know, I've attended church my whole life since birth. Not, not everybody could say that, but I was. I was raised in a church from the, from the get-go. I've been taught about church, and I've taught church, and I've planted. This is the ninth church I've actually started and pastored myself. First church in English. We're really excited about that. But I, I realized... I realize that after COVID, the definition of church for many has changed. So the first question that I wanted to answer is, why church? Why should I join myself? Why should I attend a church? But because of COVID, I realize that's not the question anymore. The question is, what is church? What is church? Because with the advent of the digital age, a lot of people attend church online. In fact, you can watch any pastor on the planet 24-7. I know people, friends of mine, they, they listen to diff several different pastors online because you don't have to drive to North Carolina to hear Stephen Furtick. You don't have to drive to Dallas to hear Tony Evans. You don't have to drive to Ohio to hear Rob Parsley. You don't have to drive to California to hear Bill Johnson. You can do that from the comfort of your home, am I right? And I have a couple of friends, and I'm going to be honest, they're not here today because they're watching online. <laughs> and uh, it's common right now, they quit going to church, but they just don't know it yet. I'm going to say that again. They quit going to church, but they don't know it yet. They think, well, I watch this guy online. I watch that guy online. I actually attend. A, I'm part of a small group online in another state. And I realize that they think they're attending church by watching people online and, and attending a small group online, but there's no local church presence in their life. You know, it used to be before technology that if you wanted to attend church, you actually had to get into your car and go to it. Am I right? But now people can connect to any church in the world. In fact, we have people right now connecting with us from Africa, Europe, Russia, Florida, Montana, South Dakota. I mean, all over the world, Texas. So the real question we have to ask is, is there a such thing as a local church anymore? Is, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Without a doubt, Technology has changed the way how we perceive church, okay? So we're going to talk about this question today. How many of you remember when the plague started last year? You know, we were gearing up for the biggest day of our lives, Easter Sunday. We were going to have the biggest Easter egg hunt in Alexandria, am I right? We were going for like, I think, 30,000 eggs. And uh, just about as we were about to do that, COVID hit us and we were shutting down. And I found ourselves taping our Sunday message, and worse, I found myself sitting in my own living room listening to myself preach. 
Now, I want you to know that's pretty humbling, first of all, because I always do that. What the heck is this? Why do I always do that? You know, there's always those manners that you don't know about. Am I right? You know what I'm saying? But you don't know. But when you watch yourself, why did you do that, Steve? Why did you say that? Talk about humbling. But you know what's tougher than watching and listening to yourself? On my screen, there's a little number in the bottom. How many of you know what that number is? That's the magical number of the people that are watching online with me. And as the service went on, that number got smaller. And I thought, I'm losing them. I'm losing them. 15 minutes into my message, I've lost them. Oh, my gosh. What is wrong with those people? Anyway, that was really humbling for me, okay? <laughs> I know none of you would have, would, would, <coughs> were doing that. But anyway, but so it seems like we've entered a new, church, a new age for the church, or, or have we? Have we indeed? So here's the thing I want to encourage you with today. Watching church online is not the same as being the church. Hello? Now, I love to preach and teach God's word, but when we look at what church is supposed to be, the church is supposed to be more than just watching teaching. If you're just watching teaching, you're not, a t you're not part of the church. Just because you can watch church online doesn't change the fact that there's something different. You're the church. Watching church is not being the church, okay? Because you can watch church online. That's a fill in the blank, by the way. It doesn't change the fact that you are the church. So I want to talk today, what does it mean to be the church? Because so many times we all make this mistake. We go by a building, we say, man, that's a beautiful church. Or that's an ugly church. Or man, they don't even trim their shirt. You know what I'm talking about? But the truth is, that is just a building where the church meets. The church isn't a building and it never has been. Go to that next slide. There we go. You don't have to, there we go. The church isn't a building, and it never has been. I'm going to say that again. The church is not a building. You know, people get mad. They say, well, well, how come you're meeting here? How come you're meeting in a school? Well, my friend, one of my great pastor friends is mine, they built a 400-seat auditorium for a million dollars. And I said, a million dollars? That's a three-bedroom house in our area. Buildings here start at 10 million. And we're saving our money, but we're not there yet, okay? And I'd rather spend my money on planning churches over the world and meet cheap in other people's buildings, for now, anyway. But, but church, it's because we got this idea that church is a building. It's, not, it's never been. The word church is used 114 times in the New Testament. Not one time does it refer to a building. It always refers to a people. Let me give you a few examples. Acts 12, 5. So Peter was in prison. Bad story for the church. But the Bible says the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Can you imagine all those buildings praying for Peter? No, it wasn't the buildings. They were people. Acts 14, 27, on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith for the Gentiles. They didn't gather a bunch of buildings. They gathered the people because church is people. Romans 16, 5, greet also the church that meets at their house. Their house wasn't the church. It was the people that met at their house that was. So what is church? Why church? What is church? The word church originally used in the Bible has two meanings. If you know any Greek, it's ekklesia. Ek, kaleo, ekklesia. Ek means out of, out of. Can you say out of? Out of, ek, out of. And kaleo, where we get the klesia part, means called out. Ekklesia was a common term used for their city councils. They were called out of their city to meet together for a specific purpose. So ecclesia has more, has three meanings, really. You're called out from something to meet together, second thing. And the third thing is for a reason, okay? That's what always means. The church is a people that has been called out from the rest of the world to gather together, and only together can they fulfill the mission that God has given them. That's right. Okay, so the, the first century church, church meant that they had been called out from their normal lives to assemble together for divine purposes. They weren't just called out. They were called out to meet together and to do something together. We honestly cannot be the church by ourselves in our homes. You know, it's like, like being a, a, a professional football player. You cannot be an NFL player if you're not on a team. You can't. You're just a wannabe. Colin Kaepernick is not an NFL player anymore because he's not on a team. So you got to get on the team to actually be the church, Okay. So we've been called out of the world, called together so that we can fulfill God's purposes in our lives. And that's part of the God's DNA that he put in us. 
Part of our DNA cries out to make a difference in our community, in our family, our neighbors, and our world. Am I right? We're not just here taking up space and oxygen. God actually has a purpose and a mission for us. It's a mission and a purpose that we can't do by ourselves. And it's so important to God that you cannot fulfill it at home by yourself. Matthew 28, Jesus said this. Then Jesus came to them, and, and if you know this scripture, this is, a, this is the, probably the most important scripture of the New Testament. We have called it the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and you make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Do you know why this scripture is not as powerful as it should be in English? I mean, if you speak other languages, you know what I'm talking about. Because the word you in English can be singular or plural. And we, we, when we hear you, most of the time we think he's just talking to me. No, no. Here, the word you, every, every part of this is plural. He's not talking to one person. He, the command is not written to individuals. It is, it is plural here. Meaning that as a group, you must go out into the world. As a group, you must make disciples. As a group, you must teach them to obey. As a group, you must baptize. So here's the one thing you need to know today. My sermons always have two things. One thing to know, one thing to do, okay? Here's the one thing you need to know. The mission of the church is to disciple nations, and that's not something we can fulfill by ourselves. We have to be part of a team. The truth is to make a difference in our world, we have to work together. Now we have the Olympics going. How many of you remember when they changed the rules and they let uh, professional Basketball players put together dream teams, hockey players. You, before, it, it, you couldn't be a professional player to be part of it. And you may not remember this, but just because we had the best players in, assembled in one team meant that they were actually going to win. We're actually seeing this right now. Because people who are superstars sometimes have a hard time playing together as a team. And, and you can't win no matter how good you are. You can't win it by yourself. You just can't. We need a team. The truth is we as a church, we can only fulfill our mission as the Lord, the one that the Lord has given us if we play as a team. So let's look at the winning recipe for church and for a team. And we, that's in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 46. Notice what it says here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. We don't talk like that. They devoted themselves to. It wasn't just something on their list. They devoted them. We're going to talk about it in a minute. And what else did they do? Every day. Can you say that word, every day? Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. See, to fulfill God's mission for them, they had to devote themselves to some things. You know, we rarely use the word devote when it comes to God or church. Am I right? Now, we can be devoted to our jobs, to our mission when we're in the force, armed forces. We can be devoted to making money. We can be devoted to getting out of debt. We can be devoted to our families. But rarely could we say honestly that we have devoted ourselves to God, to prayer, to fellowship. Devoted. Do you know what devoted means? Devote means to give all or a large part of one's time or resources to a cause. And that's a painful word. But that's the recipe. See, I understand the dynamic of staying home because of a plague. I really do. But we have to be honest with ourselves that many times we watch online so that we can devote our lives to other things than God. Eventually, God has to show up in your life or he's just not important to you. I, I just, the words of Jesus haunt me where he says, could you not even tarry one hour with me in prayer? Not even one hour. The reason we meet on Sunday is because Sunday's the first day of our week. I know it feels like Monday is, but actually Sunday's the first day of the week. But because we, we had Christian roots in our, the founding of our country, they gave us the day off so we could worship God. It's been that way since the 1600s. The first of our day. Because when we put God first in our life, the first of our week, the first of our tithe, the first of everything, man, life goes so much better. It, it just, it, there's a difference because God blesses the rest. So 
let me just say this. It takes time and effort. Go to that next slide. It takes time and effort to devote yourselves to something. But God himself knows that if we don't do devote ourselves to our mission, the mission will never be completed. It takes time. It takes effort to devote yourself. See, I don't want to get to heaven. Hear me. I don't want to get to heaven and face Jesus who gave up everything for me, bled and died, knowing that I withheld almost every part of my life from him and the mission he gave me. We have a mission, and so I'm inviting you to participate and devote yourself to that mission. And our mission is the same all around the world, the church. We're to reach our culture. We're to reach our neighborhoods for Jesus. That's why this Saturday, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to some of the poorest neighborhoods in our city. We're going to a sequoia, you know, and we're going to be showing them the love of Christ. We're going to have our prayer teams, our youth out there talking to people. We're going to be out there. So the first thing we're doing, though, is we, we devote ourselves to prayer just like the early church did. That's why twice a year we devote 21 days. Now, I know not everybody can be here for the 21 days of prayer. It starts tomorrow at 7 in the evening, one hour of prayer. But we put the first 10 minutes online so that you can hear, hear our focus for the day, and then you can pray with us if you can't make it. I know people have lives. But I would be, it would be strange to be devoted to God and not even find one of those 21 days that you could show up and pray with other people. There's a different dynamic when we pray together. There's a different dynamic when we are together because the, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. That's something that doesn't always happen in our house, okay? So this Monday, we're going to start our 21 days of prayer, and we're going to cry out to God for our country, for our communities, for our family, and for our lives. So my, my challenge is, is, is to set aside an hour, hour, whether you get here or not, set aside an hour. Devote yourselves to prayer, just like the early church did. And this Saturday, we're going to do that community outreach at Vernon, Vernon Woods Park. Petting farm, how easy, 10 to 12. All we have to do is love on people, and the pets will do the rest. Am I right in the Holy Spirit there? Okay. Friday, August 20th, at the back to school at Creekside Community. You know, we, we've done outreaches to the police where we give them, uh, you know, a Chick-fil-A and stuff. And I asked them, what was the worst community in our area? And they said, Creekside Community. I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to ramp up what we do there. We're going to love on people. We're actually going to be giving food away um, to the people there, okay? So, I, and I just want to say a fourth, our biggest outreach for the fall, and I'm really excited about this, we're going to have a fall festival. It'll be a week before Halloween on a Saturday morning at, at Mount Vernon out in the field. It'll be the same field where we did our Easter egg hunt, but we're going to have a field of candy. We're going to have all kinds of blow-up rides there. We're going to do big advertising. We're going to try to get five, 600 people to show up. And I'm going to have the power team there. If you've ever seen them, they're, they're, uh, their arms are bigger than my legs. And they, 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 they take a, a frying pan and they curl it up. And uh, th literally, they'll take a frying pan, they'll curl it up. They're, they're ones that, the ones, the rip, uh, they'll take a, a big rebar and they'll just bend it like nothing. And they do these feats of strength. And as great evangelists, then they tell the good news of Jesus. And we're going to have them come. We're going we're gonna to let the field of candy draw people. And then we're going get, to get the, the super duper guys uh, bring people to Christ, okay? See, our slogan is that we love God, we love people, and we have fun, and that's, that's, that's what we do. But I want you to know we've tweaked our mission statement. I, I don't know if they can put it up. It looks pretty dark there right now, or is that just my TV? Okay, is this my TV? No, it's, it's all dark. Okay, here's, here's our mission statement, and that's attracting people to the good news of Jesus and inspiring them to grow. And that's, that's going to be our, there it is. That'll be our new mission statement from now on. Because as the church... Giving out food isn't enough. If we can feed bellies, but if we never show them the master, we've wasted our life. We really have. So our mission statement and everything we do from now on, we're going to ask ourselves, am I attracting someone to the good news of Jesus? And I am. am I helping them grow? I'm inspiring them to grow. Those are the two things, attract and inspire. We're trying to inspire you to grow in your walk with God every Sunday and our Wednesday nights, our small groups. I hope it's reaching you, okay? Hope you're hungry. So together, together, the church, we can make a difference. This year, we have an action-packed year because of outreach, of work, where we can make a difference with our church. To make a difference, guess what? We all have to pull together. We have to pull our time, our talents, our resources. Only then can we be the church. Only then can we be the church, the called out ones that make a difference. Fulfill a great purpose. So here's the one thing to do, and that is participate in our 21 days of prayer, our outreaches, um, our, our, or our Sunday teams. Let me quickly share. I've got two minutes, but I'm going to go about three or four. Uh, let me quickly share five things 
that you can't do in your home by yourself that you can only do when we meet together. And by the way, there's, if you want to do an interesting word study, take like the New American Standard and look the phrase to, uh, together or, or with one another. 25 things in the New Testament that Jesus spoke about that you can only do together as a church. But let me tell you one, five quick things. First of all, you can't have, have un, uninterrupted time. One thing is to have, uninter, have uninterrupted time to hear God's wisdom. Go to that next slide if we can. Okay, uninterrupted time. Do you know when we watch from home online, the dog's vying for our attention, our kids are running around, you know, and we're on our phones, you know, looking at something else. It, in church, we are forced to put down our phones. We're forced to sit down, and for once, God can speak to us. We hear things in church. I can be speaking one thing, but God will be reminding you of something else. That's the beauty of church. I'm giving God one hour of my life to speak to me. That's right. Am I right? We used to have a dog. He has now gone on to his reward. But every time we would pray as a family, he wanted to be in the middle, and he wasn't enough. He wanted to be petted. He was barking. When we do communion and closing hours to pray, that, I, I was trying to go, Lord Jesus. And you know that dog, excuse me. I'm telling you, he went home early, if you know what I mean. But anyway, second thing you can't do by yourself is, is you can't be touched by God in corporate worship. See, but when we come together, we can actually be touched by God in a different way in corporate worship. See, corporate worship is, is part of heaven's culture. It's deep in our DNA. And the Bible says, and it shows many times when we worship together, something happens that doesn't happen when we worship by ourselves. Let, let's look at, uh, and, I'm gonna, and you're going to be doing this in heaven. Look at Revelation 5, verse 11. Okay. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne. Notice they were together. And the living creatures and the elders, in a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. See, it's in our spiritual DNA to worship God together. It is. When we worship God together, God's presence comes in a way that doesn't happen when we worship God by ourselves. Someone told me, well, pastor, I don't see, I don't feel anything when I sing. And you know what I told him? Stop singing, start worshiping. There's a difference. Close your eyes, picture God standing before you in the thousands and millions of angels and sing to him, worship him. And something rises in your heart. There's a feeling, I mean, I'm, sometimes the presence of God is so strong, the hair on my arm stands straight up in worship. We have become a people who have become mediocre in worship. But I'm telling you, the worship services of the first century rocked the church. They would worship and pray so hard that the earth actually shook when they prayed. Hello? Close your eyes. Picture God. Stop singing. Worship. Worship. I'm telling you, one of the great, you're missing out. You're wasting that first 20 minutes where we come, we worship God, and we allow him to mold and change our hearts and lives. Third thing you can't do by yourself is when we're in church, participate in the move and mission of the church. See, we get to spread the amazing news that Jesus loves you. He died to forgive you. He's alive. He's bringing new life to all who believe in him. What an incredible message. And most of us sit on it all our life. You know, let let me give you a a picture of your life. You're like a little brook, a little, a little rito, a little, little like stream, a little, um, um, what do we call it? Creek. In Ohio, we call them cricks. But anyway, so little crick there. But it twists and it turns, it bubbles, it splashes. It's beautiful, but it has no strength to it. But you know what happens? Eventually, that brook hits another brook, who hits another brook. Before you know it's a raging river. And before you know it, something happens. Momentum, power, and that's where Niagara Falls comes in. Niagara Falls didn't start that. It started with a little brook. And together they made something big. And that's how the church is. By ourselves, we don't have power. We don't have momentum. We don't have that strength. But I'm telling you, when we get engaged in God's mission, we make a difference. When we're all pointed the same way. Some people think, well, pastor, I'm just going to give my money and God will have to be happy with that. You know, the truth is, it's great that you give money. But God asks for your life. He asks for your life. 
You know, I did that when I was a teenager, by the way. I turned my back on God when I was 18. I went to college in, in rebellion to God. And I told God, God, you're just going to have to, I'm just going to make lots of money in business. You're just going to be happy, have to happy, be happy with that because I'm not going to, because I knew I had a call to be a missionary in my life. I said, I'm just not going to do that. In fact, I don't even believe you ever called me. I think you just want me to make lots of money and send, send, send missionaries. That very night, an angel appeared to me, glowed so strong, could barely see, had a big Bible in his hand. And it said to me, come and read. And this is the word, what I read. It's from Isaiah. I will go before you and I'll make the rough places smooth. I'll break in pieces the gates of brass, cut and sunder the bars of iron. I'll give you the treasures of darkness, the hidden riches of secret places, so that you may know that I, the Lord God, have called you. I said, what's this hidden riches, secret treasures and stuff? The people who don't know Jesus. Oh, they're the treasures of the world. God doesn't care about diamonds or gold or silver or anything like that. No, the treasures we live with, the treasures are right next door to us. Those are treasures because God bled and died for them. God loves them. God created them. And we have a mission, church, and we can't do it by ourselves. We need to do it together. Fourth thing, I'm almost done, seriously. Use your giftings to make a difference in the life of others. See, God gives us a picture of the church as a body, okay? We're a body made up of many parts, okay? You may not realize this, but you can't live without all your parts. You really can't. Am I, if, you're, if you woke up today and your heart decided to go somewhere else, you wouldn't have made it today. Am I right? It's amazing how little parts can be so invaluable because you don't realize it until you miss it. How many of you ever have ever pulled a tooth and there's an empty there and it's hard to chew now because of that one tooth not being there? That's how you are. Do you know, I want you to know that you have giftings, not just money, time. You have something. Christ is in you for me and Christ is in me for you. You have something. Right now, we have people right over that daycare center that are sacrificing their Sunday so that you can sit here without your crying, screaming babies. Am I right? Praise the Lord for them. We need more of them. We, do you know this did not look like this this morning? People came early and changed it around. Those, those bulletins, the angels did not put those bulletins on your chair. No, people actually did that. And when we go through that door at my sermon as it ends in one minute, guess what? There are donuts waiting for us. The angels did not bring them. You know, we, we, uh, we're going back to Mount Vernon High School. It's a big auditorium in September. You know, we could have gone back this month. We could have been there today. You know, I said, no, we're not ready because we, most of our teams moved out. We, we had two years of, of military moving out and we don't have all the teams we need. We need you to make a difference with your life. Do you know when people greet, even the people that greet you come in and they make you feel different, they make you feel like a family. Our role here, our job is to make you feel like a family, to melt your heart so that you can say yes to Jesus. That's really what everyone here that works to that, for that did that. They made you feel special and God can move in your life that way. The worship team, the people who do the video, the, the graphics, all that. So use your giftings to make a difference in your life. And that's, that's, and when we start back in September, we're going to need help. Do you want to make a difference with your life? Talk to anybody who's already doing something, or you can go online to our website at WashingtonCommunityChurch.com. Go to Next Steps, and there's a place that says Get Involved. We will help you get involved. You can talk to Pastor Terry, Pastor Joseph. You can talk to anybody doing something. They'll help you get involved. The last thing, church gives you a place to bring your unsaved friends that will introduce them to Jesus in an easy way. We're a family here. And you know, a family can't be digital. You know, um, it has to be relational. That means we actually have to meet together. We have to pray together. We have to fellowship together. Show that next picture. How many of you have seen this picture before? We can get it up there. Ooh, it's taking time. Oh, there it is. How many of you go out to eat with your family and that's all you do? Hello? There's no such thing as a digital family. Hello, people. <laughs> this is the family we need to be. Go to that last slide. That's the one. Get back to it. There we go. That's where we're, we're, we're together worshiping God, all focused on one thing. That's where, because you are the church. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your head with me and close your eyes? If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know God. I, 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 I've gone to church, but I don't have a living relationship with him. Right now, we can fix that. The Bible says that he's waiting. He's knocking on the door of your heart to come inside you, to become Lord of your life. It's an amazing thing. I'm telling you, you can be born again. It's something you feel. It's something that's life-changing. It's simple. All you have to do is 
is invite him in your life and and he'll come in and make a big difference. And it's crazy how many people still have not. We got a lot of visitors, first time guests today. But I'm giving you an opportunity to go out a different person. And so it's so simple. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. So I'm going to help you in a prayer. In fact, family, let's, church family, let's pray this all together. Dear God, I open my life to you. Jesus, come inside me. Be Lord of my life. I believe that you're the son of God. Believe that you died for me. Help me to live for you. Amen. Spirit of God, fall on every person right now in Jesus' name. Would you look here for a minute? Let me give you last instruction. If you're here, first time guest, fill out the connect card right over there. We have a little VIP booth. We got a $5 Starbucks card or Dunkin' Donut card we want to give you in exchange, and we will pray for you for the next 30 days. We're not gonna, we're not gonna email you to death. We will though send you a little more information about us and who we are as a church family. We'd love to get that Connect card from you. If you receive Christ today, put that on your Connect card. We have a special book waiting for you to help you learn to take those next steps. All right. Are you glad you came to church today? Am I right? Amen. Hey, we're going to be talking about spiritual DNA for the next uh, four or five weeks. Tomorrow night, we've got prayer. Saturday, we're going to be with the petting farm. You are dismissed. Go over there. Get a donut on the way out. Don't forget, if you want to go out to eat with us, we have a lunch Connect. Just Stay a little longer. We'll grab you and we'll all go together. God bless you. If you need prayer, our prayer people are right here.